Hey, garden nerds, we have a sponsor for this episode. True Leaf Market has been a supplier of exclusively non-GMO seeds since 1974. They offer a wide selection of seeds, many of which are heirloom and organic, for everything from vegetables to flowers, grains to herbs, and specialty seeds. I'd say where they shine is in their huge selection of seeds and growing supplies for sprouting and microgreens. So if you love that, you'll love this. Their seed packets are affordable and are available in sizes from the home gardener all the way up to bulk wholesale. Visit trueleafmarket.com and use our promo code GTOTW10. That's GTOTW10. Now on with the show. Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This week, my guest is Noelle Johnson, better known as the Arizona Plant Lady. She's the author of the new book, Dry Climate Gardening, and it's about growing beautiful, sustainable gardens in low water conditions. As you may have guessed, Noelle lives and works in sunny Arizona, where she's a horticulturist and landscape consultant. Thanks for chatting with me, Noelle. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. I see that your focus is on landscaping and non-edible plants for dry climates. And while it may seem like that's only something folks in the desert need to learn about, if you look at the drought map in the U.S., drought has a hold on more and more of the country. I mean, here in California, even with all the rain we've had, more than three quarters of the state is still in moderate drought or worse. So did your passion for low water landscaping come from that influence from drought conditions or was it something else? Well, I have, I initially, I'm from California. Oh. I, I'm from Los Angeles and moved to Arizona 37 years ago when I got married. And the desert is a very uh, dry, different place. And so dry climate gardening is a way of life it's a way of gardening in the desert and regardless of whether there's drought or not, because most plants in the landscape, unless they're natives are going to need supplemental irrigation. So that, that is what inspired this book to help people learn how they can create those beautiful outdoor spaces. Yet my upbringing in California, where even as a young child, I remember incidences of drought and, and how we had to be very careful at home and we had to, to cut back on our water usage. And so with the changing climate and a lot more drought than there used to be from when I was young, uh, dry climate gardening is a way to create more resilient outdoor spaces. So whether you are in times of drought or without, you know, you're going to have a garden that's going to flourish and, and look great. Yeah, I remember. Well, it's funny because I was just traveling to Seattle for the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival recently. And I, you know, with wherever I'm staying, I'm not flushing the toilet like, you know, because we're conditioned to not flush the toilet unless you really need to. Mm -hmm. And I realize that in other places that might be weird still. But we're, you know, we, we have, it's sort of ingrained. So you just moved to Arizona and took that on as like, okay, this is continuation, but even more so it's more extreme, right? So it is. <laughs> what kind of, what, where in Arizona are you living and what do you have growing in your landscape? Let's take our listeners on a quick tour. All right. So I live in the greater Phoenix area. I live Southeast of Phoenix and our my garden, I love color. I love lush greens. And so I have many wonderful drought tolerant plants that don't look drought tolerant. And I love color. I have things blooming throughout the entire year. I have hummingbirds and butterflies and, and all sorts of beauty outside of my window. I do have some cacti and I have succulents as well. I think they look wonderful in combination with flowering shrubs. I do have an edible garden. I have um, citrus, apple, and peach trees. I live on a third of an acre. Ooh. And it's just enough room for me to have enough have enough of a playground to play in for myself. And 
for me, I like, I love the ability, especially where I live, that no matter what time of year it is, there's always something beautiful outside. You know, we can garden 12 months out of the year and people are really shocked at what's possible while managing our water usage and the types of plants that you can choose um, that can handle the lower water, the water availability, yet still look amazing. You mentioned you garden year round. Is that true of your veggie beds as well? Or do you have a dead zone in there too? 12 months a year. Really? Beautiful vegetables. Mm -hmm. How are you protecting your veggie crops? Tell me, I must know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the biggest difference, one of the, the wonderful things about living in a dry climate is we have fewer insect pests than other parts of the country. My oldest daughter lives in Michigan. She has a beautiful garden, but she has so many bugs. I, yeah. never, I don't even know what they all are. <laughs> and so a dry climate limits the amount of, of insect pests that we have to deal with. We, we, get, we have some, but not that many. But to grow vegetables throughout the summer months, ideally we put shade cloth on our vegetable beds beginning in mid-May or when the, when the temperatures hit 100 degrees and above and then usually we're going to take it down in mid-September and then we'll start getting busy with planting edibles in late September early October. Nice. Now back to dry climate plants. In our industry we hear the phrase right plant right place all the time. Uh, so what does that look like in a dry climate? This is something people get wrong a lot. All the time. <laughs> All the time. doesn't matter what region you're gardening in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so first of all, it has to deal with making sure you have enough room for the plant to grow to its mature size. That's number one. Second, we need to match a plant's um, it, well, sun exposure requirements. Um, where is it going to do best? Can it handle the shade? Can it handle bright shade? Does it need filtered shade? Does it need full sun? And most plants that produce the most blooms and flowers really do best in a full sun environment, but there's a little wrinkle involved because if you are in a dry climate and particularly in those hot summer months, the sun can be a lot more intense. So just because a plant may say full sun on the label does not necessarily mean it can handle the full sun where you are. Those labels are meant to be very broad and for all different regions so just because it says full sun how can we tell whether it can handle the full sun in our in our garden or not and that's where looking at local resources is really important such as a local nursery or a local garden center where you have nursery certified professionals who can help you with that. You can look at botanical gardens nearby, note where the plants are growing and doing their best. And most larger cities and municipalities have plant guidelines or have links to plant guidelines online, which can really give you region specific exposure requirements. Yeah, I think that that resource of a local professional who knows how plants behave in that area specifically is so useful for people. And I often refer people to their local nursery. That said, not all lo local nursery professionals know what they're talking about, but it's a start. That have no business growing in your climate at all. And you're just going to experience failure. I've seen that here. I've seen that in other places. I have seen, I have seen desert plants being sold in my daughter's Michigan Home Depot and in an area where she gets to negative five in the winters and the plants they're selling can only handle 10 degrees at a minimum. Right. So local nurseries are an invaluable resource. Yeah. And, and big box stores, I have often said that they are treating the plants that they carry as any other product on the shelf. They're not really nursery professionals. They're just putting stuff out and hoping that you'll buy it before it dies. <laughs> really. Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. They're not going to take care of them well at all. And a local nursery does. Yeah. All right. So your book, let's talk about that for a bit. Your book offers some really great advice for plant care in extreme heat from thick layers of mulch to putting up umbrellas over plants during heat waves. You mentioned shade cloth earlier. That's very important. How else can people protect their plants and keep them thriving in high heat aside from obviously choosing the right plants in the first place? <laughs> yes. So, you know, if you, if you listen to the news, you are hearing more incidences all over the world of unusual weather. And for us, it was summer of 2020. You take anything bad that happened, you just pile it all in 2020. It just <laughs> encapsulated it all. And yeah. here we had just out of control, hot weather. Now, yes, we're the desert. We're used to hot weather, but we shattered records. We didn't just break them. We shattered them. And even native plants were showing a lot of stress. And it is important to, yes, use plants that are tolerant of the weather conditions, extreme weather conditions where you live, even if they don't occur every year. When it comes to heat, there's a couple of things that you can do. If you know, and, and you can know, just check your weather. If you know that you are going to have a heat wave, that's temperatures above normal for one or two or three days coming up. One thing we can do is to help get our plants ready for that is water them extra deeply the day before. Give them an extra big drink. And that big drink is going to give them an, ex an extra reservoir of water being ready to fight the heat of the next day and the next few days. So you're not going to water every night before just one for the next three days or so that is going to help another thing you can do is in the evening it's still hot but just when the sun starts to go down go out there with your hose now you're not going to water the base of your plants but you're going to lightly sprinkle them just a light mist just takes a minute less than a minute just lightly mist your plants and what that does is it cools that area it cools that plant off it creates a little microclimate and it helps that plant to cool down and so it's not really using much water at all because we're not watering the base of the plant we are cooling off the outer space for that if you have a plant that tends to struggle when it's really hot and we are seeing all over hotter summers whether you are in the midwest um, along, you know, in California or mm -hmm. in the Southwest, like me, it's happening. And if you have plants that are struggling with that, uh, consider getting rid of them or moving them to an area where maybe they get a little more filtered sunlight or some relief from the sun in the afternoon and plant something that is more heat tolerant. One of my favorite tips is when you are walking through your neighborhood, if you're walking the dog or you're driving down the street when it's really awful and hot outside, notice what plants are thriving and doing fine. And notice what exposure they're growing in. If you don't know what the plant is, take a picture of it with your phone and go to your local nursery and say, hey, this plant's doing really great. Uh, I think I need this. And they'll tell you what type of plant it is. and observation is a really great tool in helping to know what's going to handle these really high heat events. Yeah, I think it's funny because here in California, the plants that often do the best are not the California natives, but the Australian natives, you know, and I feel bad because I want to put more California natives in my garden, but they, they don't do as well and they don't look as good so I'm, I feel awful for saying that out loud, but that's, that's sometimes, so. I, I understand that. And yeah. our gardens, native is good where it works, mm -hmm. but there are so many wonderful um, dry climate adapted plants. We grow lots of plants from Australia and they rarely have any issues yeah. and our climates are changing. And because our native plants are having issues, that is a clear sign. Mm -hmm. and and that they're not handling it as as well 
Yeah, and I think it also has to do with the fact that a lot of people put in native plants and they continue to water the way that they would water non-native species. And so uh, they haven't, the roots haven't gotten, gotten a chance to dive deep down like they would if they were in an entirely native environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, speaking of native or non-native species, how the heck are we supposed to prune cactus? I'm terrified of them. <laughs> You know, one of my early jobs as a horticulturist was on a golf course, and I was in charge of everything but the grass, so all the trees and things, and it was in uh, an area where it was right in the middle of the desert, so desert mountains and, and landscape all around us, and homes were going in, so they were having, they were, they were clearing oh, the wow. desert areas, so I would go in there with my crew and we would dig up cactus mm -hmm. and we would dig up all the cool species and then we'd plant them back down on the golf course in the landscape areas. So I got really good at uh, moving cactus and also from personal experience getting um, hurt by cactus. I was going to say, are you wearing like armor, chain mail? What do you wear? <laughs> no, I would just wear, <laughs> we use a lot of rubber straps, to be honest. Rubber oh. straps were really helpful and keeping us protected and, and things like that. But sometimes accidents do happen. You know, when handling cactus and smaller is better, if you are moving, doing things with big cactus, hire professionals to do that. Mm -hmm. But for smaller ones, you know, a good pruning saw works really well for making your cuts. Or if it's a smaller cactus, you can use some loppers. Don't touch the cactus with your regular pair of garden gloves because you can ruin your garden gloves with that. You need to provide a barrier between the gloves and what you're handling. You can use, if it's, if they're really small, small thorns, you can use several layers of newspaper. Hmm. You can use carpet remnants too. Uh, pieces of carpet are very handy for handling cactus, cardboard, works as well. And if you're doing little cactus, you can use a pair of kitchen tongs uh, and use that to place your cactus where you want it to go. That is and, so clever. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> yeah. If you've got little bits of cactus that fall to the ground, uh, just buy a pair of kitchen tongs just for that. And you can use it to pick up the cactus and dispose of it. So smart. And, and then you've got your loppers, your pruning shears, your, your pruning saws, for the big ones. Well, that's those, that right there is worth listening to this podcast for <laughs> that tip, <laughs> those tips right there. <laughs> now there are some really great design ideas and helpful tips in your book. And you include an entire section on plant profiles that list native and non-native species that work in dry climates. And it's sorted by, you know, trees, shrubs, perennials, etc. What are some of your tried and true favorites? All right. One of, I'll mention an Australian favorite, and that, I have two, those are Valentine Bush and Bluebell's Emu, and they have very beautiful foliage, and what I love about the Valentine Bush is it has reddish pink flowers that begin to bloom in January and will last um, into early April, so you get wonderful cool season color when there's not a ton of blooming otherwise. Bluebells is a wonderful shrub which has blue-gray foliage and violet flowers predominantly in the spring and the fall and it can handle hot full sun exposures, shrugs it off, doesn't bother it whatsoever. They do very very well. Natives that I like to use are Tacomas and that's T-E-C-O-M-A. And there's a bunch of different species and varieties within there. Now these are lush green, larger shrubs. So you get that really beautiful lush green foliage. You have uh, trumpet shaped flowers in shades of yellow, orange, or red, depending on the variety. They can also handle those full sun situations beautifully. And then for a perennial that I really love to use, I love to use penstemons. And penstemons are perennials that are native primarily to the Western half of the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. 
And there's different species of those. My favorites are firecracker penstemon. That's penstemon eatoni, and it has orange red blooms. It blooms throughout the entire winter into spring and hummingbirds and bees are so happy when I have it out there. And so those are those are some of my absolute favorites. And you'll notice all those plants have flowers because I'm really mm -hmm. into the flowers. <laughs> yeah, and I think every photo of a penstemon you'll ever see is with a hummingbird you know, <laughs> feeding on it. Absolutely. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Well, you those were great suggestions. And there'll be there are a lot more in the book, which is great. But it's tip time. So do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the garden nerd audience? <laughs> I do. Now, my number one was one I already discussed was uh, observe. Observe what's growing in gardens nearby landscapes and and what exposure they're growing in and and how do they look when there's really challenging weather conditions. So that's number one. Number two, some people, dare I say a lot, have a hard time pulling out a plant. Oh. They feel bad, like they're I'm killing this plant. I feel terrible. Well, your outdoor space is meant to help your home look good, curb appeal, but it's also meant to bring you joy. If your plants, if you have a plant that constantly struggles and no matter what you try, it's not doing well, put it out of its misery and get rid of it. If you inherited, if you, if you came into a home and you inherited a, a garden or a landscape, and you don't particularly like a particular plant, it's your home now. You don't have to keep that plant. Life is too short to put up with something that's lackluster and just not your style. You know, this is your place. Go ahead and put in something that, that speaks to you, something that looks pretty, something that you're gonna get enjoyment from. Thank you for giving people permission to call a time of death on something. I think that's really important. I do it certainly with vegetables and especially vegetables that are being grown kind of out of season where it's too hot for them to grow. And they're like, my broccoli's full of aphids. I'm like, yeah, pull it. <laughs> don't eat that. <laughs> don't try. Unless you want the extra protein, don't eat nope. that. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm wondering if you have a tip on some of the logistics about irrigating for dry climates? Irrigation is crucial in a dry climate in most cases to have nice, to have plants, to have a nice outdoor space. And even if you are going with natives only mm -hmm. in these changing circumstances and more drought, even natives need supplemental irrigation. Now, standing there watering with your hose is not the way to go because water runs off and it doesn't permeate deeply. If you are hose watering, you're gonna to wanna to put your hose on a plant on a very, very slow trickle for half hour or more to allow that water to permeate deep. Deep roots means stronger and healthier plants that are able to withstand drought. However, the best way to manage your water efficiently and use as little as possible as drip irrigation systems. Mm -hmm. Ditch the sprinklers. I know many people, and I see a lot of this in California, don't just use sprinklers for their lawns, they use it for their other plants. Mm -hmm. And on a hot day, up to 50% of that water evaporates right away before it ever hits the ground. So it's right. very inefficient. Drip irrigation delivers water right to the source, right to the roots, and it slowly drips out and it permeates the soil beautifully. And to go even further with that, to have that beautiful outdoor space and different types of plants, you want to group your plants together on a single irrigation line or single watering line, depending on the frequency of water that they need. So if you have trees that need supplemental water, well, they should be on a separate line. They don't need to be watered that frequently. When it comes to your ground covers, your shrubs and your vines, those can all be put on the same line most of the time. And because they're gonna need water more frequently. Then if you have a landscape full of cacti and succulents, don't assume that they don't need supplemental water because a lot of those may come from regions in the world that get more rain than you do. Mm -hmm. They do best with some supplemental water depending on the kind of weather you're having. And so if you have a large number of them, 
go ahead and put them on their own irrigation line and turn it on as needed. I do have in the book a section on if you have just a couple of succulents or cacti that just need water every once in a while. Um, I have my milk jug uh, drip irrigation trick where you can slowly drip water to, to those types of plants. That's great. And people will find that in your book. Um, I just want to say interject really quickly that if, you know, folks who are living in Los Angeles may be familiar with this, and it may be the case in other municipal water districts across the country, we have a stage of drought water restriction program. And right now we are at the stage where outdoor watering is limited, but if you have drip irrigation, you're exempt. So that's another reason to convert to drip irrigation because it's already more efficient than regular watering. So it's the way to go. And, and I think that it couldn't be, you know, we don't have, we don't need more reasons than that <laughs> really. No. And, and I will say this about big box stores is a lot of them do offer free workshops if you want to install your own, they sell all the supplies there, or you can hire a professional and, and have them install it for you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing those tips, Noel. And thanks for being a guest on the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast. Thank you. It's been wonderful. How should people find you or where should they look to find you? <laughs> well, I have a lot of goodness on my website, azplantlady.com. You can find me on Facebook at azplantlady.com and on Instagram at az.plant.lady. All right, Garden Nerds, that's it for this week. You'll find a link to Noelle's website on gardennerd.com, and we'll also post links to her social media feeds and her online course. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Show your support for this podcast and the other free stuff on Garden Nerd by becoming a Patreon subscriber. You'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as gardennerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!